Welcome. This is Brian Wood, Medical Director for the Mountain West AETC Project ECHO Telehealth Program. Each of our weekly sessions starts with a short talk focused on issues relevant to HIV clinical medicine. The following talk was recorded live here at University of Washington. We will now take you to this week's talk. Great. Thank you, Brian. Hi, everybody. Happy to be back at ECHO. I'm Jamie Darnton. As Brian mentioned, I'm a primary care doc and addiction medicine doc in Seattle at Harborview and Evergreen Treatment Services, a large opioid treatment program here and in other parts of the state. And I spoke a few weeks ago about some of the regulatory changes and evidence behind telemedicine in provision of care for patients with opioid use disorder and hoping today to uh, spend a little more time talking about some of the nuts and bolts of the clinical visits and actually providing the care through this modality, which is new to all of us. I've been doing telemedicine through Evergreen Treatment Services for about five years though the way we've been offering the services has changed pretty dramatically too in light of some of the regulatory changes. I want to also, before we jump in, just mention that I'm hoping if there's interest to be able to come back and do some brief topic discussions on other topics in addiction medicine. So hoping to kind of gauge the crowd and see what topics are of interest. So during the presentation today, if you think of something you'd like to see covered in this forum, please just throw it in the chat and hopefully we can leave with a list of things that people are interested in and that I can use to kind of help determine future topics. So I'm going to jump right in. And again, I'm just going to try to very briefly review some of the material we discussed uh, last time, just so it's fresh in people's minds. Talk about some of the breaking news that you may or may not be aware of as far as the um, very significant new regulation around the DEAX waiver. And then really talk about kind of in more theoretical terms about how do we approach risk-benefit decisions in terms of having patients come in for monitoring, which I think is really the major clinical decision in this era of treating folks for opioid use disorder in, in the COVID era. And then talk about some specific strategies for using telemedicine in the provision of care in certain scenarios. And I hope there'll be time for questions and case discussions as we go along. So I'm trying to cram everything from last time on one slide. I won't go into too much detail, but please refer to the details from last time. But these are the five major regulatory changes we discussed. Number one probably being the, the major one, which is the public health emergency exception to the Ryan Height Act, which formally made prescribing a controlled substance without an in-person examination and establishment of relationship between the provider and patient in person illegal except for a very narrow set of telehealth exemptions. And for the duration of the public health emergency, that aspect of the act is is suspended. So it is permitted to prescribe controlled substances after a telehealth visit. And specifically for buprenorphine, the DEA has further specified that telephone visit, if adequate information can be gathered, is also adequate for establishing that relationship in order to prescribe buprenorphine. The language around that recommendation makes it sound like that's probably something that's not going to stick around. But I know there's a lot of interest in telehealth, that exemption to the Ryan Hyde Act, sticking around even after the public health emergency is no longer. Some changes to HIPAA where the um, OCR Health and Human Services won't seek penalties for people who are using HIPAA non-compliant platforms in the good faith provision of telehealth. So, you know, it's pretty easy to contract with companies that do provide HIPAA compliant platforms, but Skype or the uh, Apple FaceTime, you know, those are HIPAA non-compliant, but could be used in a pinch without fear of penalty for HIPAA violation. Likewise, 42 CFR Part 2, the kind of more stringent privacy requirements that bind substance use disorder clinics, there's a new provision saying that in cases of medical emergency as determined by the provider, you know, you can forego that written consent process. Item four is about reimbursement, that CMS has really expanded reimbursement for services where beneficiaries can be in their homes now. They don't have to be at a remote site, and they've boosted rates to equal the fee-for-service rates with many payable service codes. 
And then finally, the DEA exempted folks from having separate state DEA registrations if they're prescribing in multiple different states during the crisis. And then finally, one slide on the data for telemedicine and care for patients with opioid use disorder. There's not much. There were two randomized studies looking at psychotherapy for patients already on medication-assisted treatment with methadone. And there was no difference in the number of sessions attended, percent drug positive urines, or degree of therapeutic alliance, which is, I think, a concern of some people. Am I really going to be able to connect with my patient in a way that's therapeutic over telehealth? And then there were three retrospective non-randomized studies of medication management, one in methadone, a large one, and two in buprenorphine. And again, there was no worsened retention in care, difference in time to abstinence, which were the outcomes looked at. I think it bears mentioning that in all three of these, the patient was in some remote kind of rural clinic and the provider was beaming in, but there was ancillary support. There was urine drug monitoring and check-ins with nurses or counselors and things like that. So there haven't been any studies looking at provision of care by telehealth to home, which is expanding now with the loosened regulatory environment. So the breaking news, so exactly one week ago last Thursday, the Secretary of Health and Human Services issued a practice guideline update for buprenorphine administration. And this essentially creates an exemption to the buprenorphine waiver requirement. So this is usually the part in any presentation about opioid use disorder where I say, if you haven't gotten your waiver, please consider it so you can provide the service. That's no longer required. Any licensed physician, MD or DO, who has a DEA license will be able to, this probably in a number of days once this guideline goes into the federal registry, prescribed buprenorphine. There is a limit to 30 patients at one time, though the guideline specifies that this limit doesn't apply to emergency room physicians or hospital-based physicians who aren't going to be maintaining someone on buprenorphine but are starting them on it during a hospitalization. And they specified that the provider should place an X on the prescription and associate that prescription with the diagnosis of opioid use disorder. So this is really, really exciting stuff and really ought to expand access for folks. People who do already have their waiver can still use it and people can still obtain their waiver. And if they anticipate wanting to treat more than 30 patients at any one time, you know, that would be a good idea. Might be a good idea anyway in case this guideline could be revoked. Uh, So, you know, this is brand new but pretty exciting. I also just wanted to mention, since last time we met, the CDC has released provisional overdose data and an update, and they looked at the year 12 months ending in May of 2020, and the overdose deaths have increased 18% from the year prior to over 81,000 deaths. So this is the highest it's ever been. There was a slight dip down in 2018 in overdose deaths for the first time in 30 years, and We're all used to looking at these epidemic curves now, but the hope at that time was maybe we'd rounded that peak and some of the expansion and treatment would be paying off in terms of reduction in overdose deaths. But it really looks like we're still on the upswing. And I think a few trends to point out is that the biggest month over month increase in overdose deaths was from March to May. And I think this represents the fear that a lot of folks in public health had that the stress of the pandemic and the isolation of the the societal response is really exacerbating the overdose epidemic. Psychostimulants, methamphetamine specifically, are playing a larger role in uh, overdose deaths. And then the other big takeaway is that fentanyl, which has been the primary driver of overdose deaths on the East Coast for a while now, has moved west. And here's a map from the CDC. All these maroon states had over a 50% increase in synthetic opioid deaths, so mainly fentanyl and fentanyl analog overdose deaths over this last year. So all of which is to say, you know, never has it been more crucial to provide evidence-based treatment for opioid use disorder, and never has the regulatory environment been more conducive to doing so. So with that, I think we'll jump into a little more on telehealth, and I think it's useful to kind of take a step back and just think in more abstract terms about risks and benefits of treatment decisions. 
you know, this is a treatment that is traditionally pretty high touch. There's a lot of provider patient contact, and part of that involves urine drug screening. This is the standard of care. There's wide clinical variation, but the standard of care is to provide pretty frequent urine drug screening, especially early on in treatment. But this is largely based on expert consensus. We don't know the utility of this, and we don't know the optimum frequency, and there's a lot of uh, practice variation. But that whole calculus is really upended by COVID, and I think it's useful to think about. And I know people are going through this thought process in other chronic disease management. You know, how much benefit do I have in managing the condition by having the patient come in versus the potential risk of disease transmission? But I think it's worth kind of being explicit about how you think about that risk. So thinking about COVID-related risk factors, I know this is something folks have been thinking about a lot, but you want to think about patients who might have a higher risk of acquisition or transmission to others, people living in congregate settings, people living with or caring for a vulnerable family member, and then the folks who are themselves at higher risk of complicated or severe disease. And this is kind of the list from the CDC of conditions that seem to predispose to more severe disease or higher risk of death. And then degree of COVID-19 transmission in the community in which you're practicing is, of course, a factor. And a new factor is vaccination status, though. I think until we get more real-world data, you know, we're encouraged to treat the risk similarly in folks who've begun the vaccination process. And then thinking about the risks of unmonitored use and of unmonitored treatment. And largely, these are related to the degree of severity of the opioid use disorder and risk of overdose. And I've listed here, this is a list of overdose risk factors and indications of perhaps unstable or severe opioid use disorder, which might, if patient has some of these risk factors might make you think that, gosh, maybe coming in for closer monitoring might be a better choice in these patients. And these are things like a history of overdose, which is very predictive of future overdose, use by IV route. If this patient's seen frequently in the ED for impairments or intoxication, certainly if they come to clinic impaired, polysubstance use, and particularly with benzodiazepines and or alcohol a history of medication diversion in the past, significantly unstable opioid use disorder, so folks that are having a hard time stabilizing on treatment, folks that are brand new to treatment or newly discharged or disengaged from treatment, they've just fallen out of treatment, both of those periods of time are high overdose risk times, recent release from jail, prison, or an abstinence-based residential treatment program where someone may have lost their tolerance and tolerance is protective against overdose co-occurring mood or thought disorder, active or past suicidality, and, you know, inability to safely store medication. Some of the factors in the community that might affect a patient's risk is whether there's high-potency synthetic opioids circulating in the community. In King County, we had the highest two-week overdose. Over two weeks from December to January, there were 42 overdose deaths in that two-week period, which is the highest it's ever been and may be related to circulation of some high-potency synthetic opioids, though that's unclear at this point. What's the availability of harm reduction services in your community and what are the treatment option availability in the community? And then that's the potential risk factors that could indicate that the patient is at risk for unmonitored treatment. But what about the risk to the community? This is a question that always comes up. If I'm not monitoring my patient's adherence to buprenorphine, you know, is that increasing the risk that it might be diverted? And we don't know that. I think it's safe to think that it may. But I do want to mention a few things about buprenorphine diversion to put that risk into context. You know, of course, I believe that for any medication I prescribe, I'd like it to be taken by the person I prescribe it to in the manner that it's prescribed. But certainly diverted or misused medications have different risk profiles. And buprenorphine, we know, is highly diverted. It's widely available illicitly. Numerous studies, I think 17 and counting at this point, demonstrate that the primary illicit use of buprenorphine in these surveys of people who use buprenorphine illicitly is for therapeutic purposes, treatment of withdrawal symptoms and reduction in use of other opioids. And that's often in the setting of poor access to treatment, people who can't get in in a timely fashion to a program to receive medically supervised buprenorphine. 
There's an interesting study out of Montefiore that shows that prior exposure to uh, buprenorphine, including illicit buprenorphine, correlates with future success, retention and treatment in office-based opioid treatment. So kind of makes sense if you think about it. People who've kind of tried it illicitly might be more motivated if they've had a good experience to seek treatment. And then an interesting study from this year, which it was a retrospective structured interview with timeline followback that really showed a correlation between number of days of illicit buprenorphine use and reduction in non-fatal overdoses. So, you know, this may be, I think it's early days yet, but a version of buprenorphine may in fact have some of these unintended positive public health effects. So when you are measuring these risks, of course, you know, in some cases, clearly the risk of unstable drug use and unmonitored treatment outweigh the risk of acquisition or severe disease. And that's kind of an easy decision to provide more in-person monitoring and more intensive intervention. And sometimes it's the opposite, where someone's clearly pretty stable from a substance use perspective or at low risk for instability and at high risk for COVID complications. And that's kind of an easy decision. And of course, most patients kind of fall in this gray zone. So in the time we have left, I'd like to move on to telemedicine, which is potentially a good option for folks in the gray zone. In some ways, you can intensify care while still minimizing risk, disease transmission risk. And one of the... um, topics I want to turn to specifically is the initial visit. This is the part that's pretty new to telemedicine. It hasn't been studied at all of having an initial visit by telemedicine. And there's really no practice guidelines to guide us here. You know, I think it's worth thinking about, and sometimes you don't have the benefit of this knowledge in advance, but if you do... It's worth thinking about if the initial visit should be in person or not. And the way we've been doing it at Evergreen Treatment and to some degree at Harborview is if a patient is entirely new to treatment, if there's any type of diagnostic dilemma, you know, does the patient really have an opioid use disorder? If other substances are playing a big role in the presentation, you know, that's maybe a case where it's really worth having the patient come in and take in all the necessary infection control precautions to protect everyone involved in the encounter. When you're talking to a patient in the COVID era about treatment options, SAMHSA and uh, the Provider Clinical Support System Network really kind of explicitly say that it's worth, you know, of course it's the patient's choice, but there's a lot to say for initiating buprenorphine in this setting. It's much easier to titrate to an effective dose quicker. There's a lot less clinical contact required than methadone. And it may be an option, even a temporizing option in patients who ultimately want to pursue methadone. You would conduct the visit, the H&P, the substance use history in a similar fashion. And if you can gather some objective findings from the medical record, that's helpful. Clinic or ED visits where this was discussed, prior labs or urine drug screens. And then, of course, the PDMP and can be useful corollary information on someone's prescriptions of controlled substances. Physical exam, you can get a pretty good physical exam oftentimes to look for some sequelae of intravenous use. You can look for, you know, sclerotic veins and for detecting withdrawal. We'll often have the patient lean in and so I can get a look at their pupils, look for tremor, yawning, that type of thing. And then, you know, I think in this setting, you could conduct a kind of modified cow score and observe someone taking the medication theoretically on telehealth. But I think common practice in folks delivering treatment by telehealth for the initial visit is to really counsel a patient on self-starting, which is frankly how we're doing the vast majority of our initiations anyway and before COVID and is a safe and efficacious way to start someone on the medicine as long as they can kind of understand the instructions and kind of have enough impulse control to follow through with them. And there is a score, people may be familiar with the CAL score, the clinical opiate withdrawal score, which is provider completed score that can kind of grade withdrawal. Well, there is a validated subjective opiate withdrawal score And probably the threshold for safely starting buprenorphine is anywhere between 11 and 17. 17 is kind of the higher end. And I did just kind of copy that here so you guys can see. It's a little bit more patient-friendly than the cows. And, you know, most patients know when they're having withdrawal. I frankly don't use this 
very often at all. But in the patient who's nervous or does like to kind of be more methodical about it, this could be an option to help them determine when it's the right time. And I'd like to talk a little bit about situations where a patient needs more support. So this might be a patient who had been stable and has resumed opioid use. This might be a patient who is having trouble stabilizing to begin with, or it might be a patient who's having trouble with non-opioid illicits. And there are a few options of ways to provide additional structure and support in those settings. You can to see the patient more frequently. You can certainly, if it's an issue of ongoing opioid use, you know, evaluate your dose. Is the patient on an adequate dose of the medication? You can decrease the length of prescriptions, you know, in someone who is really more of an issue and people who may, might lose their medication or might be tempted to take more than prescribed. Though, of course, that does require the patient go into the pharmacy more frequently. So there's a risk there. In certain patients, you know, you may want to convert to an in-person visit with the appropriate infection control precautions so you can kind of really see what's going on. You could refer to telemedicine delivered counseling. As we saw, there's evidence supporting that as an efficacious treatment and refer to virtual community supports, AANA, SMART, Buddhism-based recovery. Pretty much all of them have a lot of online options now. And then, you know, if higher level of care options are available in your community, that might be another thing to consider. And then what about increasing structure where adherence is a concern? Well, some of these same techniques we already discussed about less ready access to large amounts of medicine, more frequent check-ins. There are a few other options. Some of these are suggested by the American Society of Addiction Medicine's Task Force on COVID-19, and I want to go through some of them. Again, these are kind of creative suggestions. None of this has been really studied, but you could create the expectation. We've done this several times of a dose observation during the telehealth visit. So say, well, we're going to see you next week. Please hold off on that day's medication until our visit because we'd like you to take the medicine during the visit. You can observe the ingestion of the medication at that time. Virtual pill count, you know, asking a patient to, you know, as part of an expectation. Again, you want to present all these as non judgmentally as possible, as just ways to ensure safety and adherence and not as, as something kind of punitive. And video directly observed therapy, that's a particular interest of mine. I have a next slide goes into a little more detail. That is an option, but reimbursement is all over the map for that. But I'll go into a little more detail on that. And then, of course, there's the injectable buprenorphine or the sublocade. Now, that does require in-person visits, but monthly, and it really takes the adherence issue off the table. You know, this medication only works if you take it, and in someone who is having trouble reliably taking the medicine or frequently in getting interrupted, who's interested in the injections, that might be a good option. And then the ACM task force mentions this. I haven't run into anyone who's actually doing this, but it's an interesting idea of basically having the patients self-administer oral swabs of the oral fluid testing for drug testing and then kind of displaying their results. So for what it's worth, that was another idea from the task force. Yeah, another quick word on video DOT. So a group at the University of Washington did do a pilot study of just 14 patients using this video platform that was developed for remote observation of tuberculosis treatment. And there was pretty good, you know, the feasibility and acceptability, which were the outcomes they looked at was good. And there's a larger study underway now, a controlled randomized multi-site trial at UW and BMC in Boston. But essentially, the patient uses this application to record themselves ingesting the medication, and it's an asynchronous delivery, so the provider or the clinic can verify that at a separate time. And it also allows for two-way communication, and so kind of an interesting use of technology. We're actually really also looking at it for methadone patients where, you know, it's probably more useful in that setting because there's so much higher risk to that medication if it's misused or diverted. So that's all I have. I just want to summarize that, you know, it's kind of an an exciting time. There's a lot of need. This is a life-saving provision of medication-assisted treatment with buprenorphine is a life-saving treatment, and there's 
fair number of barriers to its provision under normal times, but a lot of those are being kind of struck down. And particularly now with the ability of DA registered physicians to prescribe, you know, we might really be able to increase access for uh, patients during a period when they're at increased risk for poor outcomes. And again, you know, there's no real practice guidelines to guide us here, but we really want to just think about the balance of risks and benefits of in-person monitoring and keep in mind some of these other techniques for maybe providing structure and support remotely. So I have some of my references here and some resources here and then particularly point out the ACM COVID-19 task force for people who are interested in more information about kind of all things opioid use disorder during COVID, but in particular, they've got pretty good resources about telehealth provision of services. And that was all I had. Thank you so much. I don't know how we're doing on time, but I would love to uh, have more discussion if there are questions or cases people wanted to discuss. Thank you for watching this edition of the Mountain West AETC Project Echo Didactic Series. If you like this talk, please click the red subscribe button and please check out other talks in our series. Until next time, this is Brian Wood, Medical Director, signing off. Thank you.